Hi everyone, Sister Doctor here. And I thought I'd take a moment to come and speak to you a little bit about conversations and um, difficult conversations that we sometimes have and how to maybe help them go a little more smoothly. I'll probably also share a couple of foibles and fumbles along the way. Hey, Sister Doctor, coming to you again to share some truth to empower and resources to heal. Now, obviously, these past couple of weeks have been pretty intense. There have been a lot of lots of rhetoric, lots of uh, feelings and beliefs shared. Uh, on Facebook and in, the, in social media, within the community, amongst friends and family. And sometimes it causes us to butt heads and not really um, know how to communicate with one another, how to really get our point across, feel understood, share uh, the things that we've shared. And, you know, it can be difficult. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I had a moment. I had a moment, y'all, a couple weeks ago had a moment. I was looking through my social media and seeing um, people that I love dearly and have cared about, often Christian friends, sharing their, their beliefs about um, God's hand in the election results and um, God's choice and pick of the president-elect, and I just, I just, I couldn't, I just couldn't. And I felt like people were completely uh, disregarding and missing some of the really scary and hateful things that had both come out of the president-elect's mouth, but also that had been shared by many of the supporters. Uh, it seemed like people had completely missed the, the just outpouring of, of, hatred and aggression and all of the different acts of violence um, and harassment and attacks that have been going on. And in my role, uh, in my workplace, I was having to respond to those. I was sitting with people who were scared. I was hearing reports over and over and over again of things that were happening in schools and in parking lots and in stores. And I just couldn't understand why people that I so it's loving and understanding and who kept um, talking about the love of God and the things that they wanted to see this ushering in of a revival could be missing this stuff and not really attending to it. It didn't feel very spiritual to me and I was frustrated. So after a couple days of that, like I said, I had a moment. I was ready to take some of those reports of people being beat and, and, and called names and young girls being grabbed and groped in their schools and share them on their pages and be like, thank you for unleashing the love of God. <laughs> and just to lash out because I was frustrated and I was angry. And I, I reined it in a little bit. I reined it in and took some deep breaths <laughs> and tried to just really think and pray about what would be a productive way maybe to try and reach and share um, with some of these people. And, and honestly, I, I think we also need to keep in mind that there are some people who just aren't ready to be reached, who aren't ready for the conversation. Uh, and in my teaching and my diversity work, I get that. There's, there's always a percentage that really just needs something different than what I'm presenting to the group. And if I had a chance to sit with them separately, maybe we'd be able to approach things differently. Um, but some people just aren't ready um, for the conversation or they're not ready to have it with me and that's okay. So I'm not talking about trying to reach everybody. I think we do need to, to be mindful of that and, and choose who and how we might approach things. And so I tried to do that, sit back and have those conversations and you know some of it what I finally did work, some of it not so much. Uh, one example, there was a friend who shared a post that was something along the lines of the 
let's all, you know, give the president elect a chance. Let's all work together and unify and move on. Okay. On one hand, I get that. On the other hand, I've been hearing it so much. Then again, it was kind of frustrating because it was feeling a bit more like, I don't know, a woman who's been in an abusive relationship and just comes and tells you that she's been abused and, and, and you say, oh, just give them a chance. Just stay there and stick with it. See what happens. I felt like we had kind of done that <laughs> and already knew how things were going and so it didn't feel like people were hearing. So this particular friend happened to, I guess, be the post that broke the camel's back type thing. And so I responded, um, not in an overtly angry way, but I, my frustration clearly came across when I said something to the effect of, should I also ignore all of these reports of people being attacked and harassed and hurt? Should I ignore all of that? Um, the friend responded with, whoa, where'd this come from? And invited a conversation. And in that conversation, you know, first I will commend the friend also for not getting defensive, for knowing and understanding me who was speaking enough and hearing that concern to say, what's going on? And to her credit, we had a, a good conversation where she was very open and shared or asked even at times to say, you know, I, I don't understand. I hear you saying that you're scared or that people are scared and I don't understand why. And I was able to share some of the things that were happening, things that me and my family have experienced even before. Um, this election and the fears of how those things might escalate and become more um, blatant and more acceptable uh, in, in this day and age. And how those things are scary when you're thinking about how to protect your children and how to live your life. And so we were able to have that conversation. I've, I've chosen, I think carefully, the different people that I respond to and I've had a couple of conversations that have helped us to understand each other better and kind of move forward. I had another experience where someone posted um, saying that, you know, the worst discrimination they've experienced is being Christian and pro-life. Uh, <laughs> my reaction was just kind of like, uh, um, and not that I don't understand that, but given everything else that I was hearing and seeing people experience, it again, I was like, really? Now, with all of this going on, that's what you're focused on? Um, you're not in danger. <laughs> Other people are in danger. Uh, and so I responded to that post with something to the effect of, sorry, I can't get with that right now. People are in danger. Hatred has been unleashed. I'm not safe. And the response was um, not one that furthered the conversation, right? It was um, one that triggered some fear, some defensiveness. Uh, and so what I got back was kind of a, you're being mean, leave me alone. <laughs> we basically got heads, you know, she was feeling unheard. Um, in what she was saying, I was feeling unheard. So I was like, hey, I just told you that I'm not feeling safe. Me, the person you say you love, and you love my family, you love my children, and no attending to that, no asking, huh? We missed each other there. Um, and that conversation went nowhere. You know, time will tell if we recover from it. But the point being that there are some times when you'll try to make that attempt to have a conversation, which honestly was my intent. Um, because I don't engage in the arguments and stuff that goes nowhere, right? Uh, and I purposefully was not calling anyone a name or putting a label because we already know through research and psychology and the like that when people feel uh, attacked, they get defensive. And if you're trying to actually have a conversation that furthers thing, leading with an attack is just not where it's going to get you. If your purpose is different, uh, you know, you choose. 
but if your purpose is to try to have a conversation that actually leads to some sort of understanding um, and, and moving forward together, then you're not wanting to leave with an attack. Uh, that can be hard when you're frustrated. My response is, I'm sure some of my frustration came across, and even though I wasn't attempting to attack, people might have felt that and perhaps could feel attacked. In any case, the second example, that's kind of what happened. And so that conversation didn't get go very anywhere productive uh, at this point. But what do you do? You know, if you're really struggling with, well, how do I have these conversations? Sometimes you can try the same response and get different um, things back. And at some level, we might just have to accept that. But we can say, one, definitely try not to lead with an attack. Try to lead with how you're feeling and what's going on. And hopefully the people who are closest to you and our friends will actually hear that and be able to um, have that conversation. Recall the first example that I talked about where conversation actually started and went somewhere. And, and having the conversation doesn't mean that you're always going to end with the final answer and response. You know, there are times when I've had some of these heart-to-hearts with people and we get to a point where maybe they're saying, what can we do? What can I do? You know, what do you need right now? <laughs> and I remember one where I was talking to a colleague and, and I just had said, you know, I need the world to change. <laughs> and we both know that's not what we're able to wave a magic wand and do at that moment. But yet I was able to express deep down kind of <laughs> ultimately what the magic wish would be. But then also from there, after feeling understood and heard, we were able to talk about some specific things that might have helped in that moment to get through that particular tough time. That's the type of friendship and support people are looking for and that hopefully these conversations will allow you to be able to get to. Um, it's going to be a special person and a unique person that will be able to sit and really listen and hear all of the anguish and pain and fear and whatever else might be there uh, and sit with you through that to, without their own defensiveness and discomfort getting in the way so that you can get to a place of the rebuilding and the hope and the strength. It's also why you need to make sure you're connecting with the supports that can do that for you, even in the midst of having these other conversations. These other conversations might be hit or miss, so don't let those be your only source of seeking support. Uh, the other thing is, you know, if you're somebody who's wanting to be a friend or someone who's wanting to engage in these productive conversations in another way, seek out things within your community that are doing those. Here, locally, where I'm at, the YWCA does a series of meetings that focus on understanding and unpacking race. They do a series of things where they match people of different identities together who get together regularly for you know lunch or tea or just ongoing conversations to get to know one another because having contact with people who are different than you, meaningful contact is one of the best ways that we know of to start to increase people's awareness and empathy in these issues and to move some of these conversations along. I have a, a brother minister friend in Oklahoma City who is doing something like that, getting people together to have lunches and meals together, uh, not just lunches, but meals together so that they can talk and have these conversations. My sister doctor friend in North Carolina who's getting people together to talk about race and issues of race and to really delve into these issues. There's something else locally going on that's bringing churches together, churches of different diverse groups and having sacred conversations going through a, a particular curriculum of conversations and that's happening in a lot of different cities. There's probably something going on wherever you are too and so if you really are interested in learning more about that, you can do that. You can engage in those conversations, stick with it even when it's difficult and be able to move forward with some of that. There's a lot of good that can come from it and it's, it's, it can help <laughs> I think to, to end some of the back and forth that goes on, a lot of the misunderstandings, you know, 
The reality in a lot of ways is that we live in different worlds in this country. There could be things that that some people are intimately aware of and it's their lived experience that comes across their social media that other people may never even hear about or know anything of and the same vice versa. The challenges and issues of things that come across important in someone else's life another group may really have no awareness of. Our schools are still pretty segregated, our neighborhoods are often still pretty segregated, our, our churches and, and workplaces and, and things, you know, often people might come together and maybe work with somebody who's different than them and when we go back home and when we worship, when we do other things, we're really in pretty homogenous areas. So it takes a bit of effort to go out of our comfort zones to have interactions and to have those conversations. So, what am I trying to say here? I think the overall is, there is a lot coming at us, and it can be difficult to see that other people, and feel that other people don't seem to understand your experience or get where you're coming from. And some of those people, if they're very close to you, and you see that, they don't seem to get it, or even you're trying to share something and they don't seem to get it, that can be a tough point. Again, choose uh, when it feels safe, when it feels okay to try to have that conversation. When you have it, try not to lead with, with the attack, with calling someone racist or sexist or whatever, because you're just likely to, to trigger a real strong offensive reaction and it's not gonna get you where you want. That can be tough because it's, it's asking a lot when you're angry and frustrated to, to rein that in and talk about things tactfully and, and calmly. And honestly, historically, that's often been what's asked of people and it can feel like diminishing what you're feeling and lessening it. Now, I'm not asking you to lessen anything. I'm simply saying that if your goal is to actually have a conversation that moves somewhere, you might have to use a different approach to get to that to start with. Now if you find that whoever you're talking to gets defensive anyway and isn't willing to have the conversation, then maybe that's not the person to have the conversation with. Maybe they either need to have it with someone else or, or something. Uh, find a place and say for you to have that conversation and some of the people you attempt it with will probably be open to having it and be willing to sit through that with you. Sometimes that's how some of the best relationships and the strongest allyships are made because people struggle through that point, that difficult piece, and they get to know each other better and the empathy and the understanding and the support grows. It is possible, but it is tough work. And regardless of how you approach it or what you need to do, definitely make sure. <laughs> it's just my thing, right? Take care of yourself. This can be a lot of stress these little conversations and posts and all of that um, definitely can add up cumulatively and I, I share a lot of information about racial stress and racial trauma and the impact that can have on your body. You know, a little post like that might stick with you throughout the day and you feel intense and you're upset and, and you just keep thinking about it and we have to find ways to release that not just to have these conversations, which can be healing, but are difficult along the way, but to release that on a regular, daily, sometimes several times a day basis, so that your body can recalibrate and you can function at your best and at your highest potential. Remember, this has been Sister Doctor, your resource for more truth to empower and resources to heal.